we're going to begin our journey in the field of signal processing looking at the basics of signals. A signal describes how some physical quantity varies over time and or space. So for example, in the lower left here, I am showing a waveform which could represent voltage at, say, a microphone like my voice right now, and how that is varying as a function of time on the axis. On the right, I'm showing the picture of an image, which also represents a signal. And in this case, we're capturing the intensity and color variations as a function of spatial position, with U representing the horizontal axis and V representing the vertical axis. So mathematically, we can say that a signal is a function of one or more independent variables. And in these two examples, the T, or time, variable is the independent variable for the signal that's showing a voltage as a function of time, whereas the image, we have two independent variables, U and V, reflecting spatial position. And then the dependent variable, of course, is the amplitude of the voltage or the color and intensity of the image. Now, independent variables can be either continuous or discrete valued. A continuous valued independent variable can literally take on any possible value. So here you see that no matter where we look on the axis for t, we have a value defined for x of t. I can pick any point on the axis and obtain a value for x of t. So this is said to be a continuous valued independent variable. On the other hand, a discrete valued independent variable has the function or the signal only defined on a limited set of values. And we're going to use integers to represent that limited set of values. So in this case, the signal value is not defined at 0.5. It's only defined at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now for notation, when we write down a continuous independent variable signal, we'll use parentheses around the independent variable. So we've written up here x parentheses of t. On the other hand, if we have a discrete valued independent variable, we'll use square brackets. So we've written x square bracket of n here. And we'll depict a continuous valued independent variable with a smooth curve, whereas we'll use this stem plot for a discrete valued independent variable. One way to obtain a discrete time signal, x of n, is by sampling a continuous time signal x of t. And I've shown that schematically down here. So we have some waveform that varies continuously with time lowercase t. And we decide to sample that signal at intervals of n times cap t. And that gives us these samples x of n. We say that the discrete time signal x square brackets of n is equal to the continuous time signal x parentheses of t evaluated at t equal to n times cap t, or in other words, the continuous time signal at values x of n times cap t. And examples of this include the widely used analog to digital converter for taking continuous time voltages and converting them to a sequence of numbers representing those voltages at specific instances of time. And then a digital camera samples a two-dimensional image to give us a series of pixels. Now periodicity is an important property of signals and that we're going to see quite often. A signal that repeats a pattern is said to be periodic, like these two signals that I've depicted down below. The period of the signal is the interval at which it repeats. Mathematically, we can write that x at t plus t naught is equal to x of t for all values t and some value of t naught. So that says that the period of this signal is t naught. And similarly, in discrete time or with a discrete independent variable, we can write that x of lowercase n plus cap n is equal to x of lowercase n for all values of the independent variable lowercase n. And in this case, cap n would be the period and it's going to be an integer, of course. So if I look at my examples here, y of n down here repeats every four samples. It's the same value at 0 as it is at minus 4 and at 4 and at 8 and so on. And so the period is n equals 4 samples. 
Now it turns out that eight samples also works because if it repeats every four samples, then it'll also repeat every eight samples, and so on with 12 and every multiple of four. Similarly, for the continuous time signal, Z of T, we can see that this one repeats every two seconds. So I've got one period from 0 to 2, another period from 0 to 4, and then 0 to 6, and so on. And this also will repeat at multiples of 2 seconds, at 4, at 6, and so on. Now we define the fundamental period to be the smallest repetition interval for the signal. For my discrete time signal, the smallest interval over which it repeats is capital N equal to 4, whereas the continuous time signal, the smallest interval for which it repeats, is T naught equals 2 seconds. Closely related to the idea of period is that of fundamental frequency. And frequency tells us the number of periods per unit time. So we define the fundamental frequency of a signal, say F naught, if we're dealing with a continuous time signal, in terms of the fundamental period t naught. So we have one period for every t naught seconds, and one over seconds is the same as units of hertz. So we'll often write that as hz when we're talking about frequency for a continuous time signal where the units on the independent variable are seconds. So for this waveform, we saw that the fundamental period was t naught equals two seconds, and that means that the fundamental frequency is one half hertz. Now we're going to look at some examples of signals that are periodic and not periodic. I'm going to start off by looking at a saxophone producing two different notes, a note A in the musical scale and a note D flat, and then we'll look at a speech signal. Now before we look at those signals, I want to say a little bit about how we display signals. First of all, once we have signals in a computer, they've got to be discrete valued because a computer can only store values of the signal at specific instants in time. When we visualize this, if we only have 100 points or so that we're going to look at, it's fine to use a stem plot, but if we have signals that have a lot more points, then it's very common to connect the samples with straight lines. So we're visualizing it as if it were a continuous valued independent variable. And this gives us visual clarity when you have a large number of samples because stems just get too compacted and difficult to distinguish. And we'll also often use axis labels for the continuous independent variable in order to visualize the signal. And we're going to do that in these next examples. So this first example, I have a saxophone playing a note A and we're displaying a little over two seconds. This is 2,000 milliseconds, so that's about two seconds. And we can listen to this sound. And if I zoom in on the interval from 500 to about 570 milliseconds, you can see that this signal really looks quite periodic. It appears to be repeating. Now we know that the signal as a whole is not periodic because it has a start and an ending point and then this stuff in the middle so it doesn't strictly satisfy the mathematical definition of a periodic signal. But if we look at over a shorter time interval it certainly looks like it's a periodic signal and if we evaluate the period we see that there's 22 periods in 50 milliseconds and that corresponds to 440 periods per second or 440 hertz which happens to be the fundamental frequency for the note A. Now this is a different sound being played by the saxophone. This is a note D flat, and this D flat is a lower tone than the A, and we can listen to that. And again, this signal is strictly speaking, it's not periodic, it has a start and an end, and there's some variation in between, but if we look at a fairly narrow window, we can see over a limited time frame it does look very periodic. This basic wave shape repeats, and in this case we have seven periods in 50 milliseconds, and so this corresponds to about 140 periods per second or 140 hertz. Now the note D flat is actually approximately 139 hertz, which is well within our measuring precision here for now next I'm going to show you a waveform associated with a spoken word six. This is a speaker saying the word six. And you can see the first part of the waveform 
is actually associated with the S. And then the character changes of the waveform when we get to the I. And then again, it changes when we get to the X part at the end. And these differences are basically because those different sounds are different and consequently the waveforms look different. And we can zoom in on part of the signal. And if I look at the S, this is from 100 to 120 milliseconds, you see that there's a lot of oscillations going on, but there doesn't appear to be any regular structure. The uh, envelope of the waveform varies in an apparently random manner. And this is partly due because the S is formed by turbulent airflow in the constriction of the tongue and the teeth, and that tends to have a fairly random character. Now, on the other hand, the sound I has a much more repeatable aspect to it. Here we're looking at about 40 milliseconds zoomed in on the I section of the waveform. You can see that we have some features that appear to repeat or at least approximately so, in this I sound. And that's because vowels are produced by the resonant behavior of the vocal tract. So signals can be regarded as mathematical functions, and we can have independent variables that are either continuous or discrete. Anytime we work with signals in a computer, we're going to have to have converted that signal to a discrete valued independent variable. Whether a signal is periodic, in other words, repeats, and the frequency of the signal, those are important properties. 